There's a question that has haunted scientists for decades. How does a system made of simple, unreliable parts create something as astonishing as memory? Because for most of history, we assumed you needed complexity, billions of neurons, intricate biology, layers of machinery. But then one physicist showed that wasn't true at all. He discovered that memory doesn't need a brain. It doesn't need consciousness. It emerges from physics itself. And that revelation didn't just change neuroscience. It changed artificial intelligence, molecular biology, and the entire way we understand information. This is the story of John Joseph Hopfield, the scientist who proved that the universe remembers. John Joseph Hopfield was born on July 15, 1933, in Chicago, Illinois. But his world was never ordinary. From the very beginning, he grew up in a home where scientific curiosity wasn't just encouraged, it was the family language. Both of his parents were physicists, and their dinner table conversations weren't about sports or neighborhood gossip. They were about the laws that governed reality. In this household, questions were never dismissed. Every object, every mechanism, every problem, large or small, was an invitation to explore. And young John absorbed it all with an intensity that would shape the rest of his life. While other children played with toys, Hopfield preferred to take them apart. Radios, motors, circuits, anything with moving parts or hidden workings was fair game. According to accounts from the Franklin Institute, he couldn't resist the urge to pry open a device and study the secrets inside. He built radios from scratch, tuned circuits by hand, and engineered model airplanes that soared from the creative chaos of a bedroom workshop. To him, the world was built from puzzles, and every puzzle had a deeper principle behind it. If something hummed, clicked, or glowed, he wanted to know why. As he grew older, that relentless curiosity carried him to Swarthmore College. There, he entered a culture that didn't just reward deep thinking, it demanded it. Swarthmore pushed him to move past memorizing formulas and instead ask the deeper questions. Not, how do we solve this problem? But, why does the universe behave this way at all? Hopfield thrived. He graduated with an AB in physics in 1954, already known for his precision, clarity of thought and an unusual talent for connecting ideas across disciplines. From Swarthmore, Hopfield moved to Cornell University, where he began work under Albert Overhauser, the physicist behind the famous Overhauser effect. It was a mentorship that sharpened his instincts and introduced him to the frontier of quantum mechanics. Hopfield's doctoral work focused on excitons, strange quantum entities born from the marriage of electrons and holes in solid materials. It was abstract, unforgiving physics, and he mastered it. In 1958, he earned his PhD, carrying with him a sense of theoretical rigor that would become the backbone of all his future breakthroughs. Immediately after Cornell, Hopfield stepped into one of the most advanced scientific environments on Earth, Bell Laboratories. From 1958 to 1960, he worked as a member of the technical staff, an elite role immersed in the exploding fields of solid-state physics and semiconductor behavior. It was a place where theoretical ideas met real-world technology. Here, he confronted the deep physical principles behind electronic materials, communications and information. The experience grounded him, giving his abstract knowledge a new, practical dimension. From Bell Labs, Hopfield crossed the Atlantic to become a research physicist at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. ENS, one of Europe's oldest and most intellectually intense institutions, immersed him in the continental tradition of deep theoretical analysis. In Paris, he absorbed new perspectives, broadened his scientific worldview, and refined his ability to see connections between seemingly distant ideas.
At the University of California, Berkeley, he stepped into the role of professor, still early in his career, yet already carrying a depth of insight that set him apart. Colleagues noticed immediately. His work was elegant, his ideas were sharp, and he approached physics with a quiet confidence that hinted he was just getting started. In 1964, Hopfield moved to Princeton University, one of the world's elite centers of theoretical science. For the next 16 years, he immersed himself in deep physical theory, producing work that quietly foreshadowed the revolutions he would later ignite in biology and neuroscience. Despite his success at Princeton, Hopfield didn't stay confined to one intellectual world. He spent time at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge and later at the Bohr Institute in Copenhagen, two pillars of European theoretical science. These visits exposed him to new styles of thinking, the British tradition of sharp minimalist physics and the Danish legacy of conceptual clarity inspired by Niels Bohr himself. Then came 1980. Hopfield joined Caltech, not merely as a physicist, but as a professor in the departments of chemistry and biology. This move was more than a career shift. It was a leap into an entirely new scientific universe. It was here, on this campus of scientific rebels, that Hopfield encountered Richard Feynman and Carver Mead. Together, they created a course called The Physics of Computation, a daring attempt to uncover the physical laws that govern how information flows, changes, and is stored. In 1986, Hopfield helped establish the Computation and Neural Systems PhD program, CNS, a bold academic experiment that united biology, physics, computer science, and engineering. It was one of the first programs in the world devoted to understanding the brain through the lens of computation. The students who entered that program would go on to become some of the most influential scientists in artificial intelligence, theoretical neuroscience, and biophysics. In 1997, Hopfield returned to Princeton, this time not as a physicist, but as a professor of molecular biology. It was the clearest sign yet of how far he had traveled intellectually. He turned his attention to biological computation, asking how cells, molecules, and neural circuits handle information. His background in physics gave him tools no biologist had ever wielded. His experience in biology gave him questions no physicist had ever asked. From 2010 to 2013, Hopfield held a visiting position at the Institute for Advanced Study, an institution famous for hosting some of the greatest theorists in history, from Einstein to Gödel to Oppenheimer. There, he returned to pure thought. No laboratories, no departments, only ideas. In 1982, Inside a Caltech office filled with chalk dust and scribbled equations, John Hopfield wrote down an idea that would ignite a revolution. It wasn't a new machine. It wasn't a new device. It was a model, a mathematical blueprint for how memory itself could emerge from the collective behavior of neurons. This was the birth of the Hopfield network, a network built from binary neurons, each one switching between plus one and one a web of symmetric connections, each reinforcing or inhibiting the others. No central controller, no master algorithm, just a system of simple units that together produce something extraordinary. Hopfield's genius was to realize that such a network behaved like a physical system relaxing towards stability. He introduced what he called an energy function, a measure of how settled the network was. And with each update, as neurons flipped their states, the entire network slid downhill, descending the energy landscape, heading for deep valleys called attractors. These attractors were not random. They were memories, stored patterns. And no matter how distorted a new input was, cropped, corrupted, noisy, the network would always find its way to the closest memory, the deepest valley. Hopfield had created the first widely understood model of associative memory, a system that didn't just store information, it retrieved it from chaos. Scientists recognized the impact immediately. This was more than a neural network. 
It was a bridge between physics, computation, and biology. Hopfield had shown that memory wasn't magic. It was mechanics. It was mathematics. It was energy minimizing itself as the system found stability. From this single insight came entire fields, recurrent neural networks, optimization algorithms, energy-based models, the seeds of modern deep learning. Hopfield networks made it clear intelligence could be studied the way physicists study matter through the language of interactions, stability and emergent behavior. But Hopfield's brilliance didn't begin or end with neural networks. Years earlier, in 1974, he had tackled a puzzle from an entirely different domain, the astonishing accuracy of biological systems, DNA replication, protein synthesis. These processes are unbelievably precise, far more than simple chemical binding should allow. How do biological systems achieve such perfection? Hopfield proposed a bold answer, kinetic proofreading. He showed that biological systems don't rely on equilibrium chemistry at all. Instead, they use extra energy-consuming steps, molecular checkpoints powered by ATP, to reduce errors by orders of magnitude. By the end of this period, one thing was unmistakable. The fields of biology, computation and physics were no longer separate in Hopfield's mind. They had fused. In 2024, as dawn broke over the English countryside, John Joseph Hopfield, now in the quiet years of his life, received a phone call that would echo across the scientific world. The Nobel Committee was on the line. After decades of shaping physics, biology, and the theory of intelligence, the world had finally caught up. He would share the Nobel Prize in Physics with Geoffrey Hinton, another giant of neural networks. The committee recognized them for their foundational theoretical contributions to how networks store information, how memories stabilize, how patterns emerge from the interactions of simple units. It was confirmation of what the scientific community had known for years. Hopfield had revealed the mathematics of thought itself. But the Nobel Prize was only the latest chapter in a long history of recognition. Over the years, Hopfield had been honored again and again for work that crossed boundaries and rewrote expectations. He received the Oliver E. Buckley Prize for condensed matter physics, the MacArthur Fellowship for Sheer Creative Brilliance, the Dirac Medal for Theoretical Insight, the Franklin Medal for Advancing Our Understanding of Nature, and the Rosenblatt Award for Reshaping the Science of Neural Networks. Each award marked a different field, each one acknowledged a different part of his genius, and together they told the story of a scientist who refused to stay in a single domain. Hopfield's election to the National Academy of Sciences the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society placed him among the most influential thinkers of his generation. These are not honors you apply for. They are recognitions earned through a lifetime of work that bends the trajectory of human knowledge. And Hopfield's work did exactly that, again and again. Today, every student who studies artificial intelligence, every researcher who models neural dynamics Every engineer who builds memory systems, whether they know it or not, is drawing from Hopfield's ideas. Britannica notes that his contributions form a foundation for modern machine learning. Wikipedia highlights that Hopfield networks remain central to computational neuroscience. And Princeton University describes the profound respect his peers hold for him, acknowledging that entire scientific communities were shaped by the frameworks he created. John Hopfield didn't just change science, he changed how we understand the very nature of information, memory and life, and the world will be unravelling his ideas for generations to come.